In this video, I'm going to go through a couple examples of finding geodesics on surfaces. This video is a continuation of the previous video in the series on geodesics and Christoffel symbols, so please watch that video first using the link in the description if you haven't already seen it. So just a reminder from the previous video, we said that geodesics are like the straightest possible paths that we can draw on a curved surface. And our formal definition of a geodesic curve is a curve where there is zero acceleration tangential to the surface when traveling along the curve at a constant speed. So in other words, on geodesics, the acceleration vector is pointing in a direction that's completely normal to the surface. And we computed this formula for the acceleration vector along a curve, which uses the Christoffel symbols and the second fundamental form. And by setting the tangential components of the acceleration to zero, we got the geodesic equation. So any curve that satisfies this equation will be a geodesic curve. I'd also like to bring up a mistake I made in the previous video. I said that geodesics give the shortest distance between two points on a curved surface. While this is sometimes true, like with this curve on the sphere, it isn't necessarily true in general. This curve that joins the two points that goes around the sphere in the other direction is also a geodesic. So it's better to think of a geodesic as a curve that gets drawn when you move straight ahead in a forward direction when walking along a curved surface. So a geodesic is the straightest possible path because it's what you get when you move forward. So our general plan for computing geodesics on a surface has two steps. First, we calculate the Christoffel symbols, which give us information about how basis vectors change from point to point on the surface. And second, we plug the Christoffel symbols into the geodesic equation and solve for the path, which is a set of u-coordinates as a function of the path parameter lambda. So computing the Christoffel symbols for a surface is going to take a fair amount of work because we need to compute all these parts of the equation here first. We need to calculate the first derivatives of the position vector r with respect to the u-coordinates, so these would just be the tangent vectors of the coordinate curves on the surface. And as an alternative notation for the u1 and u2 coordinate variables, I'll sometimes just use the u and v variables instead. Now on top of the tangent vectors, we also need to compute the second order derivatives of the position vector r. So there are four different second order derivatives, but two of them end up being equal because the order of differentiation doesn't matter. And finally, we need to compute the components of the inverse metric tensor. So there's going to be a lot of number crunching in this video, and it's not going to be very fun, but it will be nice to show that the geodesic equation does what we want and helps us get geodesics. And really the important thing to focus on here is the results that we get, not necessarily all the algebra that we do. So for our first example, we're going to look at geodesics in the flat plane, which as you probably know, these will just end up being straight lines. So this is a pretty boring example, but it's a nice sanity check for us to do to make sure that the geodesic equation works properly in a really simple example. So the general vector equation for a plane is here. Basically, we start with some position vector p, which sort of gives us a starting point on the plane. And then we take two vectors a and b and add them together in different amounts given by the u and v variables. And this lets us get to any point in a flat 2D space by specifying the right u and v coordinates. So hopefully it's pretty obvious that the partial derivative with respect to u is just the a vector, and the partial derivative with respect to v is just the b vector. And given these first order derivatives, which are constants, the second order derivatives would just all be equal to the zero vector, since the rate of change of a constant is zero. So all these second order derivatives are equal to zero. Now let's take a look at the formula for the Christoffel symbols. Now notice how these second order derivatives of the position vector will always be zero. So it doesn't even matter what the tangent vector is or what the inverse metric tensor is. The Christoffel symbols are all going to go to zero for all the i, j, and k indexes. And for the flat plane with this coordinate system, having zero Christoffel symbols makes sense. Remember, the Christoffel symbols track how the basis vectors change from point to point. And since the basis vectors everywhere in this plane are constant and don't change, it makes sense that the Christoffel symbols are zero. So now let's go on to step two, solving the geodesic equation. Now, since all the Christoffel symbols are zero, this entire term in the equation goes away. 
So for the flat plane, our geodesic equation becomes really simple. It basically just tells us that the second order derivative along the curve is equal to zero. Or in other words, the acceleration as we move along the curve is zero. So notice that there's this k index here. So what this means is that we actually have two equations here, one for u1 and one for u2. And instead of writing u1 and u2, I'm just going to use the u and v variables instead. So we have two differential equations here and we need to come up with solutions for them. And what these equations are saying is that the second derivative of the u and v coordinates are zero. So the solution to these differential equations would just be linear equations for both u and v, where these numbers ku, kv, u0, and v0 are just constants. So it's easy to check that the second derivative of these equations with respect to lambda goes to zero. So these are valid solutions to these differential equations. So again, here's our equation for the plane, and here are the formulas for geodesic curves. And we can sub u and v into here and get this formula for a geodesic curve. And we can group the lambda terms together here and rewrite the equation like this. So really all of this is just a single position vector of a point on the plane, and all this is is really just a vector living in the plane scaled by lambda. So it's pretty clear that this formula just gives the equation of a line that lives in the plane. We just change the value of lambda to move back and forth along it. And basically these constants here just specify the initial position and the initial velocity of the curve. So given an initial position and an initial velocity, there is a unique geodesic on the plane, which is just the straight line heading in the direction of the velocity vector. So we have in fact shown that the geodesics on the flat 2D plane are straight lines. So now let's look at the second example, which is a sphere of radius one. So again, the first step is to get the Christoffel symbols, and the second step is to solve the geodesic equation. Now to get the Christoffel symbols, we need to start taking derivatives. So if you've watched video 12 in this tensor calculus series, you'll already know that the parametric formulas for the sphere of radius one are these. These are the equations for the x, y, z coordinates in 3D space, parameterized in terms of u and v. Now recall that the tangent vectors along the sphere are just the partial derivatives along the u and v curves. So along the u curves we get these tangent vectors, and along the v curves we get these tangent vectors. And we calculated the formulas for these tangent vectors using the multivariable chain rule, and just subbing in these partial derivatives calculated from these formulas. And again, since I've already gone through this in video 12, I'm not going to do it again, but it's not hard to check that these are the formulas you'll get from chain rule. And so given these tangent basis vectors, we can compute the metric tensor for the sphere, which is just the matrix of basis vector dot products. And we also showed in video 12 that the metric tensor matrix looks like this. So see video 12 if you want the full derivation of the metric tensor. Now we also need the second derivatives of the position vector along the u and v coordinates. So if we want to take the derivative with respect to u twice, then we just grab this u basis vector and take the derivative with respect to u. So this cos becomes negative sine, this cos becomes negative sine, and this sine becomes cosine. And we can do the same thing for the second derivative with respect to v, we just grab this v basis vector and take the derivative with respect to v. So sine becomes cos, and this cos becomes negative sine. And finally, for the mixed second derivative of u and v, we can either do this or do this, because the order of differentiation doesn't matter. And either way, you'll find we get this formula. So we have everything we need to compute the Christoffel symbols. We have the first derivatives, the second derivatives, and the metric tensor. And since the metric tensor is diagonal, we can easily get the inverse metric tensor just by taking the reciprocal of all the matrix elements like this. All right, so finally we're ready to get the Christoffel symbols. So just to help you understand what's going on here, the Christoffel symbols have indexes i, j, and k, and each of these go from one to two. So that means that there are two times two times two Christoffel symbols that we need giving a total of eight. And notice that this L index on the right hand side, this L index is summed over, so there's a summation over L going on here.
Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out the k equals one equation. So you'll see in this equation I have left i and j alone, but I've written k equals one here and here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out the summation over L explicitly. So I'm basically going to write out these expressions twice, the first with L equals one and the second with L equals two. So we have this expanded summation here. And we can also write out a very similar formula for K equals two like this. So the equations are the exact same except the K index is set equal to two. Now writing everything out like this, you'll notice that we have all four components of the inverse metric tensor written out explicitly. And just to remind ourselves, the inverse metric tensor looks like this. So some of the inverse metric tensor components are actually equal to zero. These off diagonal components G12 and G21 are zero. So we can just kill off these parts of the Christoffel symbol formulas because the inverse metric tensor component inside them is zero. And what we can do now is we can sub in the rest of the inverse metric tensor components for G11 and G22. So that leaves us with these formulas here. Okay, so now what we need to do is we computed the first order derivatives of R and the second order derivatives of R already, but now we need to compute all their dot products. So there are two first derivatives and four second derivatives. So there are two times four possible dot products, and that will give us those eight total Christoffel symbols that we need. So these vectors are three-dimensional vectors, and normally when we take the dot product of two 3D vectors, we'd end up with nine total terms. But since we're dealing with the Cartesian XYZ coordinate system, all these off diagonal dot products go to zero because the basis vectors are perpendicular. And all these diagonal dot products go to one since the basis vectors all have length one. So working in the Cartesian coordinate system makes the dot product a lot easier and we only need to calculate a sum of three multiplications. So let's start with the u basis velocity vector dotted with the u u acceleration vector. The dot product would just be this times this plus this times this plus this times this. So notice that these first two terms have cos u times sin u in common. So we can factor that out and get cos of v squared plus sine of v squared here. And that goes to one by the well-known trig identity. So we have negative cos times sine and positive cos times sine, and those cancel to give us zero. Next, we'll do the u basis velocity vector dotted with the v v acceleration vector. So this times this plus this times this, and the third term goes to zero. So again, we have cos of u times sine of u in common, and we can factor those out. And again, cos of v squared plus sine of v squared goes to one. And so this dot product gives us negative cos of u times sine of u. Now, I'm not gonna bother reading out the answers for the rest of the dot products because it's really just a lot of mindless work. If you want to read through the calculations more carefully, you can just pause the video. So this dot product goes to zero, and remember it's the same as this dot product because the order of differentiation doesn't matter. This dot product goes to zero, this dot product goes to zero, and this dot product equals cos of u times sine of u. And that's also the same as this dot product since the order of differentiation doesn't matter. Okay, so really the only non-zero dot products are these two here, and I can rewrite them using u1 and u2 instead of u and v. So the dot products that we care about are 2, 2, dot 1, and 1, 2, dot 2. So recall we took the formula for the Christoffel symbols and put in the inverse metric tensor components to get these two equations. Now we can sub in the dot products that are non-zero, so here i and j are 2, 2, so the Christoffel symbol 1, 2, 2 is just this dot product, negative cos of u times sine of u. And here i and j are 1, 2, so the Christoffel symbol 2, 1, 2 is this dot product divided by sine of u squared. So we can sub this in here and cancel out one of the signs on the top and bottom, and we get cos of u over sine u. And I would just like to point out that in the equation for the Christoffel symbols, we have a second order derivative of the position vector r. And as you know, the order of differentiation for second derivatives doesn't matter. 
So the derivative with respect to ui and uj is the same as the derivative with respect to uj and ui. And because the order of differentiation doesn't matter, that means that the Christoffel symbol kij is equal to the Christoffel symbol kji. And so looking at the Christoffel symbols we've calculated so far, we now know that the Christoffel symbol 212 is equal to the Christoffel symbol 221. Okay, so that math was pretty painful, but we've calculated the non-zero Christoffel symbols here. Now we need to do step two and solve the geodesic equations. So we're lucky that so many of the Christoffel symbols went to zero because that will make our geodesic equations much easier to deal with. So we get one equation from the 1, 2, 2 Christoffel symbol, and we get another equation from the 2, 1, 2 and 2, 2, 1 Christoffel symbols. Now again, since the 2, 1, 2 and 2, 2, 1 Christoffel symbols are equal, these two terms in the second equation are actually the same. So I'm going to combine them and just put a factor of 2 here. And subbing those Christoffel symbols in gives us this. And again, I'm going to replace u1 with u and u2 with v just to make things easier for us to understand. I'm also going to write cos of u over sine of u as cotangent of u, which is really just 1 over tangent of u. I'm just writing that to save space. Okay, so we have our geodesic equations for the sphere, and these are nonlinear coupled differential equations. And they are not easy to solve in the general case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with the special case of a circle of latitude on the sphere. So that means that the latitude variable u will just be some constant value theta naught. And the longitude variable v will just go around at a constant speed. So v will be equal to k times lambda, where lambda is like the time parameter for the curve, and k is just some constant telling us the speed. Okay, so hopefully it's easy to see that the first derivatives along this curve with respect to lambda are 0 and k, and the second derivatives with respect to lambda are both 0. So bringing these derivative values back up here into the geodesic equations and substituting, so this second equation becomes 0 equals 0, and we don't really need to worry about it anymore since it's automatically true. We just need to worry about this first equation. So what we need to do is, to get a geodesic, we need to choose k and theta naught so that this term goes to 0, so that the equation will hold true. So we have a few options here. Option 1 is to set k to 0, but that's not very interesting because it just gives us a single stationary point at a constant v. Another option is to make this sine part go to zero by setting theta naught to either zero or pi. But that also isn't very interesting because this just gives us the points at the north and south poles. So again, those are stationary points, not geodesic curves, so that's not what we want. The last option is to make this cosine part go to zero by setting theta naught equal to pi over two. And this is a path that goes around the equator, right? It's the curve where the latitude is exactly halfway between the north and south poles, halfway between zero and pi. So what we found here is that going around the equator where u is equal to pi over two and v is equal to k times lambda, this path is a geodesic curve on the sphere. So the shortest way to get between two points on the equator is just to travel straight along the equator on the geodesic path. But the other circles of latitude are actually not geodesics. So if we take this circle of latitude, the fastest way to get from this point to this point is actually this curve here, which is not along the circle of latitude. So the only circle of latitude that is a geodesic is the equator. And that makes sense since if we travel around the equator, our acceleration vector points directly inward towards the center of the circle, which is also the center of the sphere. You could think of it as like the center of the Earth. So the acceleration vector is pointing completely normal to the surface. But if we travel around another circle of latitude, our acceleration vector is pointing towards the center of the circle, which is not the center of the sphere. So we end up with a tangential component as well as a normal component for the acceleration vector.
Now, if the equator is a geodesic, then by a symmetry argument, since we have spherical symmetry, this means that all great circles on the sphere must also be geodesics, where a great circle is just a circle whose center is located at the center of the sphere. So all these curves here are geodesics on the sphere. And this matches up with our intuition because if you were to walk straight in a forward direction on a sphere, you would end up tracing out a path like this. So to summarize this video, we learned the process for computing geodesics on a curved surface. Step one is to compute the Christoffel symbols, and step two is to solve the geodesic equations. So going through this process for any general surface can often end up being pretty hard, but for some simple surfaces like the sphere, we can still get the actual explicit formulas for geodesics without the help of computers.